Welcome back to Lafayette, we are here, French history podcast for the American public. I am your host, Emmanuel Dubois, and today we are taking a grand tour de France. I dedicate this episode to my father, Michel Dubois, who died of cancer on April 24th. He was a great inspiration to me and loved this country, France. Merci, Papa. What I am attempting here today is blasphemy. Trying to sum up over 20 centuries of history in about an hour is ludicrous. I mean, you literally could study it all your life and not be done. But I figured that giving my listeners a quick panorama of France's history could prove a great help for future episodes, and for global knowledge. So, I am not trying to be exhaustive here, but to provide a broad idea of French history. Still, this will be longer than my average episode, and a bit drier. Lots of dates, lots of facts, but I think it's necessary. So, without further ado, here we go. Before there was France... There was Gaul. The Gauls are Celtic people. And the French, even today, like to think themselves as their heirs. The most famous example of that is Asterix, the character in comic books. So the Gauls are conquered by Julius Caesar in 52 BC. Their territory becomes Roman provinces. Part of modern-day Belgium, Switzerland, and Germany are part of it. And of course, modern-day France. This is what we call in French the Gallo-Roman or the Roman Gaul civilization. Many cities are built or modernized. Defensive walls arise, roads, sewers, all these improvements are made. And lots are still visible today. Many French cities were created during that era. The other big change is that Christianity becomes very strong in the second century and explodes under Diocletian's rule, as a Roman emperor, in the 4th century. They are laying the foundations of the future French dioceses. Even though it flourishes culturally and economically, Gaul is under constant pressure. Foreigners are attacking it all the time. It's a prelude to the coming barbarian invasions over the next couple of centuries. You have now two Roman empires. Gaul is part of the Western Roman Empire that is based in Rome. And you also have an Eastern Roman Empire based in Constantinople, now in Istanbul. So the Western one crumbles from pressure of the people living outside of it, wanted to come in, and tensions from inside of it. Therefore, the 5th century sees huge movement of population and major invasions. The Huns, for example, enter Gaul in 451. They are repelled, but the situation is dire. During the whole century, various Germanic tribes get in Gaul. One of them is the Franks, coming from modern-day Belgium. In 496, the Frankish leader, Clovis, beats other Germanic tribes and the Franks become the dominating people in Gaul, politically and militarily. And in a gesture of great political acumen, Clovis gets baptized in Reims the same year. And all the future French kings will be crowned in Reims. After various victories, the Franks unite the territory under Frankish rule by 536. It is a united, up to a point, and Christian nation. The first non-Roman one. This is why France is considered the first Christian kingdom. The fille aînée de l'église, as we say in French, which means the eldest daughter of the church. This new dynasty of Frankish kings is called the Merovingian dynasty. The name actually comes from Frankish mythology. 
The little problem with the Merovingians is that they divide their kingdoms amongst their sons. So this weakens the kingdoms and entails war. And also during this period, like the rest of Europe, the country gets more rural. The people are not city dwellers like the Romans or the Gallo Romans were. All these factors have profound and long standing impacts on the new Frankish kingdom. At the same time, Christianity plays a key role in uniting the various ethnic people living in France. Churches are built, monasteries, and the kings, one after the other, will reinforce the church's power, while the church itself improves its own structure, becoming very effective. A good example of that is liturgic art that flourishes everywhere. And many centuries later, you can still admire lots of it. Nevertheless, at the end of the 7th century, the Frankish kingdom is divided in three major parts. Austrasie, the northeast, Neustrie, the northwest, and Bourgogne, the southeast. It should be noted that Bretagne, or Brittany in English, is not part of the Frankish kingdom at this point. It will fully join France, but not until the 15th century. Brittany really has a history of its own within France's history. The Franks, at the time, have to face a new challenge. In the 8th century, there is an invasion by the Moors. The Moors are coming from North Africa, where the new religion of Islam is expanding very rapidly. They have even invaded Spain, and Spain will remain under Islamic rule until the 15th century. The Frankish military leader managed to defeat them at Poitiers in 732 under the, French, uh, the Frankish king Charles Martel. And the next big historical figure that we'll talk about is his grandson, Charlemagne. He's born somewhere in the 740s, and it will have a profound impact on Western Europe. So, as I said, he's the grandson of Charles Martel and the son of Pépin le Bref, which means Pépin the Short. This new lineage of Frankish kings will start a new dynasty, the Carolingians. And the name actually derives from the first king, Charles, Carolingian. Charlemagne is a conqueror. His army is fantastic, and its greatest strength is heavy cavalry, which is kind of a Frankish specialty. That's what Charles Martel used at Poitiers to defeat the Moors. And Charlemagne will expand the Frankish kingdom, especially in Germany, but also in northern Italy. And by 800, his kingdom is around a million square kilometers. To give you an idea, modern France is about half of that. He changes the structure of the kingdom to make it an empire. And he is crowned in Rome by the Pope in 800. He establishes his capital in Aix-la-Chapelle, which is now in Germany. And his goal is to recreate the defunct Roman Empire. Yeah. The guy is quite the visionary, but it, it won't turn out as he hoped. Nonetheless, he does many improvements. One of them is the reform of the educational system through a renaissance of Latin, the old language that had evolved a lot over the last 800 years. I mean, Latin from northern France had nothing to do with Latin from maybe southern France or then let's not even talk about the other countries that, quote, quote, spoke Latin. And these reforms that he will put to try to standardize the language, both spoken and written, will lay the foundations of the modern French language. Upon his death, his son Louis, known as Louis le Pieux, which means the pious, inherits the throne. But this empire proves unmanageable too big and they don't have a communication system as well established 
uh, in a trade system as well oiled as the old Roman Empire had. Plus there's the little detail that they like to divide their kingdoms amongst their sons. So when Louis dies in 840, his three sons go to war with one another. Until in 843, they meet and they sign a treaty, the Traité de Verdun. The empire is divided in three kingdoms. Western Francie, Middle Francie, sometimes called Lotharingie, and Eastern Francie. Charles II, nicknamed Charles le Chauve, which means the bald, becomes king of Western Francie. This new territory is de defined by rivers. There is the Esco, the Meuse, the Saône, and the Rhône. These are the rough borders of France during the Middle Ages. And it's during this time period where we move from a Frankish kingdom to actual France. France, as a state, as a nation, is born. One must understand that we are here in a feudal system where the king, although powerful, has limited powers over a limited territory. What he controls is actually relatively small and his authority is challenged by powerful noblemen all the time. The royal territory is basically the grand Parisian area the Ile de France. The rest is controlled by powerful dukes or counts. And the French kings will work over the next centuries to alleviate these limitations and establish a strong central power in France. In the 9th century, France is under constant pressure also from invaders. Moors in the south, Vikings in the north. The French call them the Normands, the Northmen. And these Northmen will establish themselves in northern France, creating Normandy. They will in due course invade England, but that's another story. The current monarchy is weaker than before, and strong noblemen unite to change it. So during the 9th and the 10th centuries, it's a very unstable period, almost chaotic at times. Kings will inherit the throne or sometimes be chosen or elected by nobles. So in 987, after the king Louis V dies, without an heir, a new leader is chosen, Hugues Capet, from the strong Robertian branch of the Frankish monarchy. The Capetian dynasty begins, and it will endure until the revolution of 1789. Eight centuries, with the same ruling family. So, during their first couple of centuries in power, the Capetian kings will make slow but steady progress to increase their authority and to expand the royal domain. The kingdom also modernizes globally. Agricultural improvement allow France to increase the yearly output enormously, therefore favoring a growth in population. Parishes and towns are established. Most of them are still here today. The local lords benefit from this growth, but in the long run, the Capetian kings will gain the most of it. During the 11th century, the Capetian kings actually rule, as I said, only over the small domain. Dukes around it are more powerful and often wealthier. A perfect example of that is Guillaume, Duke of Normandy, who invades England in 1066. And this link between the French and the English royal families will be the cause of a lot of tensions and wars over the next centuries. In the 12th centuries, the Capetian kings reinforce the feudal link between them and her vassals, the dukes, the counts, so that all the chain of power ends with the king. That combined 
with successful military campaigns by Louis the Sixth, said Le Gros, the fat, and Louis the Seventh, Le Jeune, the young, helped making the French monarchy stronger and stronger until its power over the other nobles is almost impossible to contest. Trouble arises in 1152 when the Duke of Normandy, who is also Count of Anjou, Henri Plantagenet, marries Aliénor d'Aquitaine. This woman was just divorced by the French king, Louis the Seventh. That was a very, very bad move. So Henri Plantagenet becomes Duke of Aquitaine, King of England, on top of the rest. Effectively ruling over Normandy, Anjou, Aquitaine, so southwestern France, and England. This is called the Plantagenet Empire. And it's the beginning of a situation that will come in it in the Hundred Years' War, couple centuries down the line. All the while, another situation develops. The Crusades. This series of campaigns ordered by the papacy to retake the Holy Land. France will be a key player in those. So, warrior religious orders appear in France. Known examples are the Hospitalier and the Templier, called the Templar Knights in English. And quick literary note, the French author Chrétien de Troyes writes his novel Percival in 1182. This is considered one of the first true novel ever written, and is the first story about the Holy Grail. There will be many more of them, but I highly recommend this book. So, the French kingdom and the Capuchin dynasty will become the dominant power in Europe between the end of the 12th century and the first third of the 14th. The first truly remarkable king in this period is Philippe Auguste, crowned in 1180. He will retake most of the Plantagenet possessions in France from Richard the Lionheart and John Lackland. Named like this because, you guessed it, he lacked land. Normandy, Anjou, Touraine, Bretagne, all these territories are retaken by the French king, reinforcing his own powers as well as his kingdoms. Northern France is basically under the direct rule of the French king. His son, Louis VIII, will start expanding the royal kingdom southward in the Languedoc. Louis VIII dies young, in 1226, and his son, Louis, is too young to reign. His mother, Blanche de Castille, is regent. This new king will be Louis IX, and he will become a true king in 1235. He is better known as Saint Louis, the only canonized French king. He will change the French judicial system, making the king the ultimate judge. He will also prove quite a multitasker. He takes great advantage of the feudal system of vassalage to make himself master of all lords. He retakes more territory from the other noblemen and from the Pontagenet, annexing Aquitaine, for example, Maine and Provence. In 1241-1242, the lord of Poitou, Hugues de Lusignan, rebels against his lord, the French king, and unites with the English king, Henry III. Together, they attack the French king. But they are crushed at the Battle of Taillebourg in 1242 by Louis' army. Louis himself charges the English troop on a bridge, galvanizing his troops and playing a key role literally, in military victory. This will help establish his reputation as a war leader. Louis will also be part of the Crusades. He will be in the 7th and the 8th Crusades. He will again lead his troops into battle and will be made prisoner in 1270 and will eventually die of dysentery. His actions during the Crusades, as well as his sense of justice 
and of great piety will lead to his canonization in 1297. At this point, France is the richest and strongest European kingdom. This is also the age of the cathedrals, and French civilization is hugely influential in Europe. Notre Dame de Paris, Chartres, Tours, Reims, Bourges, Amiens, all these fantastic Gothic cathedrals are built during this period. Special mention for the Sainte Chapelle in Paris. It is much smaller than all those cathedrals, but it's truly magnificent. A masterpiece of what we call Gothic flamboyant. The next period in France's history will see the temporary collapse of France as a great kingdom. It starts well, though. The king, Philip IV, said Le Bel, the handsome, is, well, strong, powerful, and respected. He, he was also nicknamed the Iron King. So he becomes king in 1285 and will do everything in his power to make the central government more absolute. He will even force the Pope to leave Rome for Avignon to be under his quote-unquote protection. He will also create more taxes to make the central state richer. He will make sure that the French monarchy is more and more recognized by law as being divine, ordained by God, and not by the church. There's a difference. This will be completed later in the 14th century. But he will also be the last great French monarch of this time period. In 1307, he has the Templars arrested and their order dissolved. They were a bit too wealthy and powerful for his taste. He initiates the order on Friday the 13th, 1307. Yeah, it comes from here. Friday the 13th. A few years later, in 1314, their leader, Jacques de Molay, is burned on the stake. And according to the legend, he curses the French king. This is the beginning of an era made famous by the French author Maurice Dorion in his stunning book series Les Rois Maudits, which means the accursed kings. I highly recommend that you read that, by the way. Since Hugues Capet, in 987, the French kings always had sons that survived and ruled. This was called the Capetian Miracle, almost four centuries of dynastic continuity. No war of succession, no serious contestation of the throne. This will change. A perfect storm is preparing. Philip IV has three sons, so everything looks good, right? The eldest, Louis, becomes Louis X in 1314. But he's of fragile health and dies in 1316. He has a son, Jean, but he dies as an infant. He also has a daughter, Jeanne. But the crown goes to his brother, Philippe, who becomes Philip V. He dies in 1322 without an heir. The crown then goes to the third brother, Charles who dies in 1328, also without an heir. For the first time, the Capetian dynasty doesn't have a clear successor to the throne. So what are their options? The first option is Jeanne, Louis X's daughter. But the French noblemen decide against it. They fear that a foreign prince could marry her and effectively take control of the kingdom. They also invoke the Loi Salique. This law, which is an old Frankish law, excludes women from inheriting land. And they adapt it, if you will, to make it so that a woman cannot inherit a kingdom. Even though the law did not state that exactly. So it's basically misogyny disguised as law. The second option is Philip IV's grandson, Edward. His mother, 
is the deceased king daughter, Isabelle de France. One problem with this choice, though. He is the king of England, Edward III. Again, the French noblemen decide against it, saying that the king has to be born in France. It's the first time that a monarch's place of birth actually matters. And it is considered the beginning of French national identity. They finally settle on Philip IV's nephew, cousin of the 300 de dead kings, also named Philip, and he becomes Philip VI. Edward III will even have to pay homage to him because he still has lands in France. But the troubles are far from over. The English king broods over the situations, the situation, but he cannot take it anymore at some point, and he attacks France in 1338. This is the beginning of the Hundred Years' War, the first major conflict between major established European kingdoms. And there will be many more between those two, France and England. Edward proves a formidable military commander and wins many victories over the French. The French military are discredited. The English size more and more territory. In 1356, the French king Jean II is captured by the English and forced to sign a humiliating treaty in with England. After, the French will retake some lost territory for over the next 20 years or so, but this is only a setback for the English. Big trouble for the French starts again in 1380, when Charles VI becomes king. First problem, he's a minor, so there is a regency, which never helps. But the biggest problem is that he has what we call now mental illness, serious mental illness, and he proves very unstable. This will favor a French civil war between factions known as the Armagnac and the Bourguignon. And the Bourguignon will ally themselves with the English. Everything on top of the continuing war with England. So for the next 50 years, the French suffer many defeats, the most famous one being at Azincourt in 1415, where the English longbowmen destroy the French heavy cavalry and infantry. The turning point of the war happens in 1429, when a young woman from Lorraine arrives on the scene. Her name is Jeanne d'Arc, Joanne of Arc. I will make a full episode on her at some point, but for now, suffice to say that she manages to rally the French army, to retake the city of Orléans, and to allow the Dauphin, that's the name for the uncrowned king, to be crowned in Reims and to become Charles VII. From then on, the French will gradually fight the English until they are completely expelled from France in 1453, ending the war. Poor Jeanne will be captured and burned at the stakes for heresy. But war is not the only issue of the time. There is a global drop in temperature, a climate change, and an overuse of arable land. These two factors provoke a drop in productivity, inducing one famine after another in the 14th and the 15th century. This also entails war, because when your territory is not producing enough food, you're trying to conquer more territory to have more food. It's never-ending. And on top of that, Europe is struck by a most vicious enemy on the second part of the 14th century. The Black Death. The Plague. It is estimated that it killed between half and the two-thirds of the Europeans during this period. I mean, imagine that. Half to two-thirds. If a similar illness were to happen in the USA today, we'd be talking about 165 to 200 million dead. 
this is a huge blow to European societies, all of them. It is by far the worst period for France. War with England, civil war, famines, and the plague. All of those leave the country extremely weakened. But from that darkness, light will shine. The king, Louis XI, then Charles VIII and Louis XII, will make the situation better, preparing the country for its next big change, the Renaissance. The Renaissance is many things. It's an artistic, scientific, and cultural revolution, mostly coming from Italy at the beginning. The emblematic king of this era is François Ier, Francis I. He will be king from 1515 to 1545 and will greatly reinforce the throne's authority and favor the Renaissance in France. Under François, the French monarchy evolves from a feudal system to a more absolutist system, where the king is ordained by God and answers to no man. This transition will be completed about a century and a half later by Louis XIV. It's also under his reign that French civilization starts to shine again. The famous Loire castles are built during that era. The most famous examples are maybe Chambord, Chenonceau, or Azel Rideau in the Loire Valley. Thinkers, scientists, and artists from all over Europe come over to France and are supported by the king himself. The most famous example is Leonardo da Vinci, who will spend the last years of his life in France. This becomes kind of a French tradition to host foreign scientists and thinkers and philosophers, and it will keep going for centuries. But the situation never remains calm for very long in France. From 1559 to 1598, the country is torn apart by what is known as the Wars of Religion. This is the time of the Protestant Reform. This also is a very complex subject, but to make it short, it's 40 years of civil war. Betrayals, changes of religious allegiance, massacres, all the worst things you can imagine happening during this period happened the most famous example is the massacre of the saint barthélemy on August 24th, 1572, where over 3,000 French Protestants are killed in Paris under the impulsion of Catherine de' Medici, approved by the king, her son, Charles IX. It ends in 1598, when Henry IV, who was a Protestant, converts to the Catholic faith and proclaims the Edit de Nantes, basically allowing the Protestants to live in France. At the end of the Wars of Religions, France is the strongest, wealthiest, and most influential European nation. And during the 17th century, it will have great statesmen, economists, military men, and kings, one after the other. The first king of that period is Louis XIII who becomes king in 1610, but he's still a minor, so his mother is regent for some time, Catherine de' Medici. In time, he will exile his mother in Blois and affirm his own control. And to me, his genius move is to put the Cardinal de Richelieu in charge of most states' affairs. This man is brilliant, ruthless, and efficient. He famously said that, in French, la politique est l'art de rendre possible le nécessaire, which means politics is the art to make possible what is needed. And that's a good summary of his worth thinking. Another literary note, Alexandre Dumas' Les Trois Mousquetaires happened during this time period. Another highly recommended read. So Richelieu will reinforce the country's economy and military. France will play an active role in the major European conflict of that period, the Thirty Years' War, that is mostly fought in Germany and involves many European powers. And at the same time, France expands its North American colony, New France. 
Quebec City is founded in 1608, Ville-Marie, now Montreal, in 1642. French explorers and settlers colonize eastern Canada, part of the Midwest, and Louisiana over the next century. It's a huge territory, bigger than the English colonies ever were. Louis XIII dies in 1643. His son, also named Louis, is only five. So his mother, Anne d'Autriche, becomes regent and works with another cardinal, Mazarin, that takes over Richelieu. So Louis XIV has a troubled childhood, not by his own fault. It's marked by the Fronde. It's a revolt of French dukes and noblemen against the crown. It will have a huge impact on his character. He will always be wary of the strong men in his kingdom. And he will work to control them his whole life. In 1661, Mazarin dies. And Louis takes matters into his own hands. He will prove that he was born to be king, both literally and figuratively. He's extremely smart, sensible to arts, himself a remarkable dancer, he's a workaholic, and he has a very strong health. He also has an ego bigger than the kingdom he's ruling over. He will live until 1715, and he will be succeeded by his great-grandson. His reign, though, is divided in two parts. There is a reign solaire, a solar reign, and a reign crépusculaire, crépuscular reign. During the first part of his reign, he will take great advantage of the peace and stability established by his predecessor. He will also hire the services of Colbert, the great economist and planifier of the time. Together, they rebuilt the French economy and modernized the country greatly. Louis is also successful at war, winning many victories. French artillery proved to be the best in Europe under his reign. Louis recognized this and had the French cannons marked with the inscription Ultima Ratio Regum, which means the king's last argument. You can actually see some of those cannons at Fort Ticonderoga, upstate New York. New France keeps also expanding at the time, because Louis understands very, very well the importance of North America, even though some of his advisors consider it a waste of time and money. Louis also starts building the Versailles Castle, and he moves his court from Paris to Versailles. It will stay there until the end of the French monarchy. He increases the role of court and uses it to subjugate the French nobles. He has a very deep understanding of protocol and pomp. By doing so, he finishes the work started a couple of centuries before him, becoming the real absolute monarch, unchallengeable, standing above every living soul in the kingdom. French king is an emperor in his own kingdom. His accomplishments inside of France and outside of it are quite astonishing, earning him the title, if you will, of the Sun King, because he's shown over the whole world. However, the second part of his reign is not as sunny. Although he doesn't suffer massive major defeats, he does have setbacks and minor defeats. And as he gets older, he also gets more religiously conservative, becoming almost a bigot and less open to advice. A bit before that, he also revoked the Edith Nantes, removing religious liberty in France. When he dies in 1715, he leaves France hugely powerful, influential, but also indebted. Next, we have Louis XV, Louis XIV's great-grandson, as I said. He is usually seen as a weaker king, but he certainly had big shoes to fill. Nonetheless, under his reign, 
France will establish itself as the cultural and scientific hub of Europe. Mathematicians like Clairaut, D'Alembert and Lagrange make huge advancements. Maupertuis and Laplace keep making new findings in Newtonian physics. The very famous chemist Lavoisier is one of the 18th century best scientists, establishing modern chemistry really. Often people compare France and England, and on this standpoint I would say that, in my opinion, England produces the best engineers and technicians, while France produces the best scientists. These two countries complete each other pretty well. Another big change is also operating in France, on a more intellectual level. Les Lumières, the Enlightenment. Influenced by English thinkers, French authors and philosophers will open the way to modernity. Montesquieu, Diderot, Voltaire, Rousseau and others will promote ideals of scientific thinking, personal liberties and enlightened government. And keep in mind, enlightened government doesn't mean democracy. It means people that rule by reason, not necessarily by the will of the people. They published the first encyclopédie, encyclopedia in 1751. And it's a key element of their movement and of modern European philosophies. There are social advancements and philosophical way of looking at life will play a key role in making Europe the center of power of the world for the next two centuries. France will remain at the center of it until the mid 20th century. To go back to the king, Louis XV is not incompetent, but he is not as interested as his predecessor was in royal duty. To be fair, his predecessor was pretty obsessed by it. So Louis is a victor in the war of the Austrian succession in 1748, but he is also defeated in the Seven Years' War, known in America as the French and Indian War. This is an enormous conflict, a proto-world war. England and Prussia are at war with France and Austria in 1756 because of colonial and European rivalries. France will be the great loser of that war, suffering defeats in North America. Quebec City, for example, falls in 1759, but also in India, in Germany, and on the seas. In the end, it's actually the enormous cost of this prolonged conflict that forces France to sue for peace. By signing the Treaty of Paris in 1763, France renounces most of its North American possessions and is humiliated at the international scene. England is stronger than ever, but also indebted. To solve this, the British will raise taxes, especially on the American colonies. We all know the consequences of that. Louis XV dies in 1774. His successor, his grandson, is Louis XVI, who was a clever and, from what we know, a good man but maybe not one strong enough to be king. Because Louis faces economical and social challenges like no other kings in the last three centuries. Although his participation in the American War of Independence proved successful, he still has to meet many challenges back home, in France. The French national opinion actually starts to matter. Local leaders are chosen sometimes elected, and they protest against injustices that have been going on literally for centuries. This all comes to a head in 1789. We are now entering the era of the French Revolution. This will define what France as a country is today. It will actually define what a nation-state is. Before that, you were the subject of the French king, or any other king, depending on where you lived. National sentiment, as we understand it today, did not really exist then. You recognized the crown, of course, but what you called your country was the local area where you lived, 
what we might call a region. The French Revolution changes all that. Many other things. It will export its ideals all over Europe and then the world. Since the Lumière, the French people have started a more profound reflection about what form their government should take. Absolute monarchy doesn't seem to be the only valid choice anymore. At this time, finances are also very bad. Louis XV and Louis XVI's reign have been marked by an impoverishment of the population. Because of all this, the king has to agree to the État généraux, or a state general. It's a meeting of representatives of all layers of the population, and it happens in May 1789. The people have lists of demand written in books called the Cahiers de Doléances. These demands rapidly transform into a deconstruction of the whole French political system. This system will soon be called the Ancien Régime, the Old Régime. Privileges are abolished. The National Assembly is created. And finally, on July 14, 1789, the people of Paris stormed the Bastille prison, dealing a deadly blow to the French monarchy by destroying its main landmark of repression and tyranny. And this type of event, the French people in Paris taking over the streets, rioting, building barricades to fight a tyrannic power, will happen again and again over the next century. So at this point, the king is still there, but his power is no longer absolute and doesn't come from God anymore. It comes from a constitution written by men. But even this constitutional monarchy fails, and the first republic is proclaimed in 1792. Louis XVI becomes the citizen Louis Capet, coming for circle with his ancestor Hugues Capet. In 1793, the newly formed republic tries to eliminate everything from the old regime. A new calendar system is implemented, that won't survive. The metric system is also adopted, and this will survive. And Louis Capet, former, former king, is executed, guillotined along with his wife, for treason. This is the period known in France as the Terreur, the Terror. In a couple of years, about 1,400 people, mostly nobles, but not exclusively, are killed in France. At the same time, various European monarchies attack France to undo the revolution. The regicide was the last drop, because France, the oldest Christian monarchy, is now a republic. And all European monarchs are shaking with fear. I mean, to them, these revolutionaries are socialists, call them what you will, these left-wing crazy guys who took over French government and no rule, and the kings and queens all over Europe are scared by this. This is the beginning of a period of great turmoil in France and in Europe. Between 1789 and 1871, France will have seven major changes of political systems, plus four minor ones. Imagine that, changing your whole political system over and over again. The country is in tatters. Parts of it are experiencing civil war, because you still have areas that still want a monarchy, and you also have foreign powers that are attacking it. France is on its knees at, the, at this time juncture, you know, at the end of the 18th century. Yet, within 15 years, that's nothing, it will conquer all of Europe, and even try its hand at invading Russia. How is that even possible? The answer has a name. Napoleon Bonaparte. This general of artillery will rise to power until he sizes it completely with a coup in November 1799, known in French as the coup du 18 Brumaire, 18 Brumaire. Brumaire was the name in the revolutionary calendar for roughly November. Bonaparte is a very successful general, defeating enemies inside of France and outside French borders. He 
completely revolutionizes military thinking, promoting a war of movement and a completely new use of artillery, making it a lot more mobile. He became consul in 1799 and takes over completely. He becomes emperor of the French in 1804. His armies, what will soon be called the Grande Armée, will defeat all of his opponents. How exactly? Well, by mobilizing all of France. France is the most populous country in Europe, about 28 million people at the time. And the French, because of the revolution, are willing to arm everyone. This horrifies the monarchies. They would never put weapons in the hands of the plebs. I mean, hello, you, you're, you would be giving guns to your greatest critics. They could turn it against you, right? But the French can, and they do. This new French army, when put in the hands of the military genius that Bonaparte is, becomes a most formidable tool, beating country after country until all of Europe, except England, is either invaded or obedient to his will by 1812. And he will put his brothers all over the map, you know, in Italy and Spain, to rule over these people. However, in 1812, when he invades Russia, it turns into a disaster. And after a coalition of countries defeat him, he abdicates and is exiled on the Elba Island in the Mediterranean. So now, Louis XVIII, Louis XVI's brother, parenthesis, there is no Louis XVII exactly, because that would have been Louis XVI's son, and he died in 1795. Still, they count him. That's why you have Louis XVIII right away, the 16th. So he becomes king, and it is the first restoration, forced up in France by foreign powers, basically. But Napoleon is not out of the game yet. He comes back to France in 1815, basically on a small boat with a dozen people. And he marched all the way to Paris. When he gets there, the army is behind him, the French people are behind him, and he retakes power. He remobilizes the army. This will be known as the 100 jours, the 100 days. During that period, Napoleon takes the fight to his enemies. And the decisive battle happens at Waterloo, in Belgium, in June 1815. Napoleon, again, is defeated by the enemy coalition in what is one of the greatest battles and most treated battles of the 19th century and probably of all military history. But this time, he's gone for good, exiled on St. Helen Island in the middle of the Atlantic. They did not take any chances this time. Again, Louis XVIII is restored and France has to go back to its 1789 borders because it would grew them with all these invasions. This new order is dictated by the reactionary and conservative European monarchies at the Congress of Vienna, ending in 1815. From 1815 to 1848, France will experience various flavors of constitutional monarchies. Louis XVIII, and especially his successor, Charles X, seem to have forgotten about the events of the previous decades, and they tried to restore part of the absolute monarchy, one piece after another. The result is that the people of Paris revolt, again, in 1830. This actually is dep depicted in Les Misérables by Victor Hugo. A colossal literary achievement. So when this happens, a new progressive king, still from the Capet and Bourbon family, is put on the throne. His name is Louis-Philippe. And they don't call him the king of France, but king of the French, to try to make him closer to the people. This is the period known as the July monarchy, because these events happen in July 1830. But even him succumbs to the temptation of restoring a more personal power of oppressing the people more and squashing rebellion. It happens a lot more progressively than it did before, but still does. In 1846, Europe is again struck by an agricultural crisis. Famines happen, people die, others go bankrupt. 
these issues on top of the in internal political turmoil create tensions on the whole continent. In 1848, revolutions happen all over Europe. France is no exception. In February 1848, the people of Paris build up barricades in the street for the third time in half a century. Louis-Philippe first proclaims that he is indispensable. You cannot do without me, he says. After a few days of that, he takes the hint and abdicates in favor of the Comte de Paris. That's why even today you have some people of that family proclaiming that they should be king of France. It's a bit funny when you actually think about it. But the people won't have it. And the Second Republic is proclaimed. This new republic introduces a novelty. The president is elected by universal, albeit male only, popular vote for four years. A conservative candidate gets a lot of traction and is elected with over 70% of the vote. His name is Louis-Napoleon Bonaparte. He is the nephew of the dead emperor. But this republic proves unstable for many reasons. In December 1851, Bonaparte wants to be re-elected in it. But the constitution forbids him to do so. Therefore, he does like his uncle did. He takes power by a coup in his own government. I guess it runs in the family. The following year, Bonaparte works to ensure he is in charge for good, for the long term. He even organizes a plebiscite to make sure the people are behind him, to make yet another change of political system in France. He wants to create a new empire, and the Second Republic will indeed be very short-lived. This Second Empire is proclaimed in 1852. It will actually do a lot to modernize France. The most concrete example is the city of Paris, which under the new leadership of Louis Napoleon and helped by the Baron Haussmann, is transformed into the beautiful capital with the broad boulevards that we all know today. Over the country, railways are built and new industries flourish. French art and literature reign supreme over all of Europe. Paris is the universal destination for artists, scientists and technicians from all over the world. France's economy is stronger than ever, catching up with the UK, the leading example at the time. On the international front, France's participation in the Crimean War is an immense success in 1856. So at this point, everything seems to be going pretty well for this new empire and for its leader. But there are clouds forming in the horizon. Clouds outside of French border, to the east. A new and powerful country is unifying. Germany. Under the leadership of Otto von Bismarck, Prussia expands. And eventually, this new country will be the North German Confederation. Completely changing European continental politics. France had been the strongest European power on the continent since the Middle Ages. She is now challenged. But clouds also appear inside of France. By 1870, it's getting a bit tired of its emperor and its system. He is not as popular as he used to be. And there are some economical issues starting to show up. And Louis-Napoleon Bonaparte also fears a united Germany. And so do the British, by the way. Pretexting that a German prince wanted to be king of Spain, long story short, even though he retracted, France declares war on Germany in July 1870. But she is not ready for war against that new and powerful enemy. On the other hand, Germany, a country that spent the last decade and a half conquering territory over all Central Europe to unify all the German-speaking people is ready. When the French send 250,000 men to the border, a big number, the Germans, in the same amount of time, are able to send almost 1.5 million. The French put on a brave fight 
one that were inspired poems by the Germans, but they're crushed nonetheless. German military skill and heavy artillery all her to defeat the French army at Sedan in the east, where the emperor himself, leading his troops, is captured and capitulates in September 1870. The empire collapses with him, and a new republic is proclaimed. The war rages on. In the midst of the defeat, Paris is besieged, while the French army keeps fighting. But the government has to sue for peace in 1871. Germany imposes its term. France loses Alsace and Lorraine. This creates a revengeful spirit that will last until World War I. It should be noted that Otto von Bismarck was against the annexion for exactly that reason. We are now entering the regime that France will have until World War II. It starts in violence with a very bloody revolt in Paris in 1871 known as the Commune. But the situation stabilizes and the Third Republic holds firm. Relations with England are a bit up and down for the end of the 19th century, but they globally improve, in no small part thanks to the arrival of a new colossus in Europe, the German Empire. France has traded a traditional enemy over the Channel for a new one over the Rhine. This new republic is a parliamentary regime, not a presidential one. It is designed to prevent a new dictatorship, and the French will be aware of that until even after World War II. Many major social reforms are made during the first 40 years of that new republic. School becomes mandatory, rights to unite and to strike are voted, and the state becomes completely secular. In 1904, the Entente Cordiale is proclaimed. It's basically an agreement between France and Great Britain not to wage war against one another and to have good relations. They have been friends and allies ever since, ending almost a millennia of regular conflicts. This period is also known as the Belle Époque, the beautiful time, if you will, or beautiful era. At the turn of the century, France is prosperous, strong, and respected on the international scene. Its colonial empire is huge, especially in Africa, and its trade system is extremely sophisticated. But again, the international situation is deteriorating. All European nation states are arming at an alarming rate. And in August 1914, they decide to use all this new 20th century weaponry with 19th century tactics. It's a complete disaster for everyone involved. This is the beginning of the Great War, later known as World War I. France, Great Britain, and Russia are at war against Germany, Austria-Hungary, and then Turkey. Other states will get involved during the course of the war. Germany attacks France right at the outbreak of the war, through Belgium. Its troops get inside of Paris. It looks like 1870 all over again. Except this time, the French are able to block and repel the Germans, helped by their British allies. But in the first few months of the war, the French suffer over 300,000 casualties. For the next three years, millions of men die on the Western Front. And this front is basically Northeast France and Belgium. The combats are so intense, the shelling so immense, that parts of this battlefield are still restricted today, too dangerous for anyone to access. In 1917, the USA gets into the war, while Russia falls into civil war and ends it on its side. France and her allies mount a gigantic campaign in 1918 until Germany sues for peace. World War I is over in November 1918. But France has suffered enormously, more than any other country in Europe. Most of the fighting happened on its soil, 
destroying entire regions. 1.4 million French soldiers, mostly men between 18 and 30 years old, all dead. Twice that number are wounded, some crippled for life. In a country of about 40 million people, that's an enormous blow. France will have institutions for the veterans of World War I until the 1990s. Special seats on buses, in cinemas, and other public spaces. To put this into perspective, the worst war that the US had in terms of casualty was the Civil War, where the Americans suffered 600,000 dead versus 1.4 million in France at this time. That gives you an idea of how bad it was. The French people are deeply marked by this war. We call it the Der de Der, which means it's an abbreviation for the last of the last. Every French town and village will have monuments to the dead. All my great-grandfathers fought in it. Luckily, they all came back, but lots of French families were not so lucky. After the war, France rebuilds and keeps improving the situation for the average people. Left-wing governments are elected, like the Cartel de Gauche, which means Cartel of the Left, plural, or the Front Populaire, which is an association of various left-wing parties. And they're making progress for the average people, especially the workers, all during the 20s and the 30s. When the Great Depression strikes, France suffers a lot, but it's not as violent as in the USA. But again, the real problem arises from outside French borders. Because of the way World War I was concluded, fascism and Nazism take power in Italy, Spain and Germany. The French and the British will do everything in their power to prevent another war, because they are so scarred from the first one. Well, to be honest, they do almost everything. But that will also be for a dedicated episode on the French responsibility in the origins of World War II. Ultimately, the war is declared in 1939. And this time, France is defeated in June 1940 after a brilliant campaign by the Wehrmacht. Even the German military leaders are surprised by this. Most of them were veterans of World War I. They cannot believe that they defeated France, a country that held them at bay for four years. The French allies, especially the British, are scared to death. The Third Republic falls along with its army. The north of the country is occupied under direct German control. The southern part is under a puppet government based in Vichy, under the Maréchal Pétain, a hero of World War I, and his minister, Pierre Laval. France lives some of its darkest hours. The French government collaborate with the Nazis. French citizens are sent to camps, arrested, or outright killed. This stain on France's history will never completely wash away. The Résistance does its best to be a nuisance to the Germans, though, and will prove a great help when the Allies invade France in 1944. Some elements of the French army keep fighting in Africa and from England also, and they will play an important role in the last couple of years of the war, on every front, not only in France. Many soldiers from the French colonies will fight and die for France, a sacrifice that is often overlooked. During that war period, another general rises to fame, Charles de Gaulle. He is the head of the fighting French forces, based in London, and basically lead the French to the victory of 1945, helped by many other French generals, alongside their American, British, Canadian, and other allies. After the war, France has to rebuild again. A provisional government is formed, until the Fourth Republic is proclaimed in 1947. It is based on the model of the Third Republic. Although it would prove very efficient to rebuild the country and to use the Marshall Plan wisely, it will also be very unstable. 
Governments never attain any majority and sometimes fall within weeks or days of their election. The French at the time are extremely divided on political views. The Communist Party is very strong, mostly because the Communists played a key role in the resistance during the war, but their link with Moscow is dreaded by lots of people. On the other hand, conservative right-wing parties also have lots of followers. This republic is unable to govern efficiently, and it has to face a new challenge, decolonization. French colonies revolt and demand independence, one after the other. War breaks out in Indochina, modern-day Vietnam, Laos and Cambodia, in 1947, and will prove to be a bloody and horrible conflict. The French are defeated and leave in 1944. The Americans, wanting to block the communist-led Vietnamese, take the French's place. We all know how well that turned out. Algeria also want to oust the French, and another war erupts there. But Algeria is different. Technically, it's not a colony. It's a French department. In the eyes of many French people, Algeria is part of France and has been since 1830. It sounds silly today, but at the time, lots of people saw it like that. This also turns into an atrocious conflict. Both sides commit atrocities. The French have a superior army, but the Algerians are fighting for their land, their home, and they have nothing to lose. You can imagine the result of such a conflict. This crisis will be the last straw for the Fourth Republic. The regime just cannot handle the situation. Again, they look for a messiah, someone to save France. So they turn to their war hero, Charles de Gaulle. France had been unstable for the last 13 years at that point. So it needs stability. De Gaulle, having been called by the government to remedy the situation, presents a new constitution to the French people in 1958. This new republic, the fifth, will be a presidential republic, where the president has a lot more power than in the third or in the fourth. This is made to make sure that there won't be any more three weeks government. De Gaulle is a great statesman, and he designed the constitution around himself. This will have good and bad consequences over the next decades. Indeed, the Algerian war ends in 1962 with the Accord of Evian, and France is still under that regime today. Now, this is where I feel we should end our grand Tour de France. The events after de Gaulle becomes president are too close to us and complex for me to continue this exercise and still be relevant without being overly long. That was epic, wasn't it? Two thousand years of history summed up in about an hour. So thank you for bearing with me. As I said, this episode was drier than what I tend to do typically, but I felt it was necessary. Gaul, the Frankish kingdom, the Carolingian empire, the birth of France, the rivalry with England, its ascension as a world power, the Lumière, the revolution, the Napoleonic Wars, then the various forms of governments and its conflicts with Germany. All of that is part of what France is today as a nation. I did have to cut a lot of elements. And that was the hardest part, actually. What to cut, what to keep, while trying to be coherent. Nevertheless, I hope this will help you to get a better broad view of France's history. Rest assured that many of the events and people I barely touched or even did not mention will be getting complete episodes in the future. I have already received a few requests, so do send me yours if you have some. So that's all for now. Thanks again for listening. Au revoir. You can find the Lafayette We Are Here podcast on Apple Podcasts Spotify, Stitcher, and other platforms, or on lafayettepodcast.com. If you wish to contact me, 
You can do so at Emmanuel at LafayettePodcast.com or on Twitter at Manu underscore photo. The music for this podcast was composed and performed by Michel Dubois.